Amen. Turn with me to Psalms 14, a continuation from last week, part two, we'll call it, so you'll hear a lot of relap of uh, verses. I've titled this, Why Believe in God? And then I end it with, why not? Why not? If I were to ask you, why do you believe in an invisible God? What is that? What is it with you Christians that you believe in some invisible God? Some invisible spirit? Some invisible power that you, you Christians, you nutcases believe? Why would you be so foolish as to do that? And that's what we're preaching on today. But we're looking at it in a different way than we did last week. Not just believing in God, a God, but in God. You know, and so let's get started in Psalms 14, Psalms 14, first three verses. Psalms 14, the first three verses. Listen carefully what the Bible portrays these people as. And one thing I like about the Bible, it doesn't mince words. Amen? It says it as it is. In Psalms 14, 1 through 3, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand or who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now, number one, we have this group over here who just, they're atheists. Or agnostic. They don't believe in God, period. You die, and you die, and you go into eternal nothingness. It's over. No judgment, no heaven, no hell, no anything. You just die and go into eternal darkness forever. Hey, let's break open the champagne bottles on that one. But then we have these that say there is no God, but really they refuse to believe in God. They don't want nothing to do with God. It's not a case. They, they lie within themselves. They lie and say there is no God because that's exactly what they're hoping for. Because either they hate God or they want nothing to do with God. I'm going to be hitting on that more this week. Last week it was the atheist. It's a fool who believes there is no God. I know you, as you talked to Ken, who just recently got saved, many of you, I'm sure, God has proven himself in my life. How about yours? Amen? Amen. So, you know, we experience God day by day. And so the question is often asked, why in the world would you believe in a God that you cannot see? That's foolishness. It makes no sense. How and the way we respond to this question is very important. Because we can either bring someone to Christ or drive him or her father from him. So let's find out a little more about it. How should we witness to somebody? Should we just come on, beat them over the head and say, you're an idiot, you're a fool, you don't believe in God, you're going to hell? That's not a good way to invite them out to lunch or dinner. And that's definitely not a way. <laughs> Watch it, ladies, I'm watching you. I mean, huh? Well, yeah, I guess if it worked, yeah. Okay, I'll try it next week. We'll see how it works. But you got to do it through love. You got to do it. You see, Jesus never, listen, here's the one sentence you got to learn, brothers and sisters. If you come up against an atheist or an agnostic, you're not out to win an argument. You're out to win a soul. Did you get that? Many Christians go out to try to win an argument. I'm right, you're wrong. And this is, will turn more people away than anything else. I'm not here to win an argument. I'm here to win a soul to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the first step we've got to remember when we get approached by people, antagonists, or whatever. Because we've got to realize many people will not come to God no matter what you tell them. But it's our job to proclaim the gospel anyway. So let's go through some steps here. How would you handle it? How would you deal with it? I covered it last week. Man, I'm going to cover some new territory this week. Number one, through God's word itself. God's 
proved it through his word. In Proverbs 9.10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That means when we understand what God, now listen, not just there is a God, but what God's all about. Who is he? What's he all about? Is he a God waiting up there to throw lightning down on people and just judge him? Or is he a God that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins? It's not enough to say there is a God. We have to explain who he is, what his personality is. How much he loved us. How much he sent his son to die on the cross for us. What the ultimate purpose was God in your life. Amen? That's the important thing. Not that just there is a God, some superpower, some higher power up there in the universe. And many people start off on the wrong approach. I not only want to explain God, I want to explain who he is. What makes up his personality? What's his attributes? What's his sovereignty? What is God and how does God can change your life? Amen? Next, in Proverbs 2.5, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now look at the structure of that verse. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and when you do, and find the knowledge of God. The Bible has everything to know about God. Amen? 66 books written by over 40 writers. And you have all about the God you serve. But how do you share it with people? Do you share it through your witness? Do you share it through your testimony? Do you share God with compassion? Or is it a judgmental type way we approach people? Do we point our finger at their nose and say, you're going to hell? They are, we know they're going to hell, but don't we want to have them make a U-turn and go to heaven? Amen. We want to show the love of God. Yes, there's the judgment of God. But then we want to give them what God is all about. In Isaiah 45, 18, a very strong verse. <coughs> For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Number one, we want to say, show that there's only one God. Not many gods, many deities. Egypt and all the false Canaanites had multitudes of deities, false gods, false carved images. And I could give you a whole list full. I'll do that sometime at a Sunday school class. But there is one God. And the one God, what does he mean to you? What does he mean to me? What has he done for you? See, we have not only to say, oh, it's one thing just to come up and say, oh, I, I believe in God, and that settles it. No, that doesn't settle it. How would we share the God that you worship to this individual to where this individual would want to worship God, to realize there is a God, not just a God up there, but a God in here. Did you get that? Not a God up there, but a God in our hearts. Amen? How has he changed our lives is how we need to portray God. I venture to say the majority of Christians today have no idea how to really present God in a loving, compassionate way. Jesus always came in a loving, compassionate way. Then he explained judgment. Then he explained repentance. Then he explained sin. But he always came with one thing to save sinners. And he saved me. And he saved you one day. Amen? That's how we present not just there is a God up there, but there is a God in here. Amen? So it's through God's word. I just, I mean, there's thousands of verses in the Bible alone that talks about, thus says the Lord. Over 2,000 times, in fact, the Bible says, thus says the Lord. But how do we share that with people? Next, through God's power. God has power. He's not some impotent God out there who can't do things or he's limited in his ability. Through God's power in Jeremiah 51, 15, he has made the earth by his power. He has established a world by his wisdom and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. God is in control. Amen? 
God is in control not only of your lives, but in this universe. He's in charge. He's in ultimate control of the world. Yes, I know the prince of the power of the air has control of this world, but even he is subject to the powers of God. Satan has limitations. God has none. Amen? God has none. As we see sin and evil rampant in the world, always remember God ultimately is in control. Praise God. And thank, yes, praise God is right. In Jeremiah 32, 17, All Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. I love these people. They pray like this. And many times we pray like things are just too difficult for God. What did I just read? Nothing is too... I mean, we couldn't call him God, God if, he, if we found that things were too tough for him. Amen? Would you want a God who had limitations? He wouldn't be God. He saved me. He saved you. He's ready to guide your life if you will let him. If you rebel, he will bring you back. He will chastise you. Many Christians have forgotten that part. Remember, he saved you, he keeps you, and he will chastise you once we go astray. I don't know about you, but I have backslid many times in my life. One big time where I lasted over 15 years. And God brought me to my knees. He said, hey, you may have forgotten me. Now I'm going to remind you. And he did. And I thank God he did because he loved me enough to chastise me. And he really brought me down to my knees one day. And God told me, not in an audible voice, in my conscience, he said, now do you remember I'm still God? See, I had forgotten that. I had limited his power through my rebellion, through my stubbornness. And yet in 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. That's how bad it is. When we forget God, in Psalms 9 and 17, it says that those nations that forget God will be cast into hell. America has forgotten God, for crying out loud. Never forget God. He's there. But how do we share it with others? In Hebrews 1.10, it says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands, not through Evolution. Which brings us to the next thing, through evidence itself, through evidence itself. In Romans 1, 19 and 20, listen carefully to these verses. Share it with people. Let them know that this world, the big bang, only happened is between their ears. Listen to what the Word of God says. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. He's talking about those that deny God. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Please get that part. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Did you get that? The atheist has no excuse. I've traveled in the military 24 years. I've seen great things. I've seen the Grand Canyon. I've gone up to beautiful mountains and streams. And God created that. Amen? He created the islands. And one day he's coming to remove them. And we need to understand, I tell people, just look around. You're going to tell me all this is by chance? By chance what? God created everything. He created you. If you look at the human body and how it's so put together by God, that is astonishing right there. The human body, even the Christian doctors will tell you that wasn't by chance. Every organ, every cell in your body was perfectly made by God. What destroyed it was sin. Amen? Amen? We don't have to look out there. We look at our own human bodies, praise the Lord. The eye alone is something to marvel at. How it was created. If people would stop and examine 
creation. The evidence is there. The Word of God in Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. That means you look up in the heavens and affirm him, and it shows his handiwork. Every star, there's great books out, signed by fantastic books by Christians, how every star and how the moon, the sun, and all the planets are perfectly aligned, and how if just one of them were out of course, it would wreak havoc through the universe. And yet God perfectly put it just the way it is. And if you were to move the sun a few feet, a few miles one way or that way, it would destroy the earth. Did you know that? There is a God. That wasn't by chance. Amen? Praise the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. In this case, the host is the stars. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one, not one, did you get this verse? Not one is missing. Every star that you see out there was put there by God. God did not forget things. How many of you forget things now? Okay, I'm in the right church. I always say I remember things. You know how many times I've walked around for my glasses? How many of you have done that? I I go to Midge, and Midge loves it. She relishes it. She waits for the moment. I go looking around, I say, Midge, I can't find my glasses anywhere. And with her compassionate, loving, sweet voice, she says, look out in your head, you knucklehead. You've never done that? Okay, I know we got humans in here. I'm glad to hear it. But many refuse to believe evidence or no evidence. Then you have the hardcore. You can only share the gospel so much. And pretty soon you got to walk away. You've done your part. If the atheist wants to stay an atheist, he's going to stay an atheist. There's nothing you and I can do about it. But it's our job to share the gospel. And how we do it is so important. Remember, one misstep, one false word, one sound or the impression of judgment, of criticism, and you can chase them away forever. Remember, 1 Corinthians 6.11 Where God said, and once were some of sinners, we were, but we were washed in the blood. We were sinners too. Remember that. When you share the word of God, when you were hostile toward God, and all of us were hostile because sin is enmity against God. So at one time, all of us were hostile toward God. And some people will say, oh, I was never hostile toward God. Yes, you were. Yes, I was through my disobedience. Now, how do I portray that to the unbeliever? Now, some will never understand why people hate or don't believe in God. The wicked heart, the wicked heart. Look at Psalms 10.4. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. He didn't want to think about God. He didn't want nothing to do with God. One word he's saying, I don't believe in God. Next word he's saying, he hates him. Which is it? Which is it? In Job 21, verses 14 and 15, listen carefully what the book of Job said. Yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? Did you get those two verses there? Who does that sound like? Pharaoh, Exodus Chapter 5, verse 2, remember, I do not know the God of Israel. I do not know him. I will not let your people go. His mind was made up. His heart was hardened. He was beyond help. And look, he says, what profit do we have if we pray to this invisible God? That's what he's saying there. Well, I don't know about you, but God has answered my prayers many, many times. Just because I don't see him doesn't mean he's not there. 
But for the hardcore atheist, it's not that they can't see him. Listen, it's the case they don't want to see him. Because if they see him, they have to realize then judgment or mercy, one or the other, is there. And they don't want to face judgment for their sin. They love their sin. So it's not a case, you know, see him or not. Even, even they can see God. Who did that? They saw Jesus many times. They saw God at work. Jesus, the Son of God. And they still say, no, nah, he's not the one. No, nah, he's not the one. No, nah, he's not the one. Well, guess what? It was prophesied, Deuteronomy 18, 15, and countless other verses prophesied that Jesus would come. Listen to Psalms 78, 22. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Did you get that? Did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. I gave a similar verse in Sunday school. It was in 1 Thess 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. They did not know God and they did not obey the gospel. In Psalms 78, 32, in spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. That means they saw it, they evidenced it. Now what causes that? Why? You say, that's stupid, that's foolish. And it gets into the next one, a stubborn heart. I just read 1 Samuel 15, 23. Listen, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. He was talking about King Saul. Psalms 81, 12. So I gave them over to their own stubborn. Now listen carefully. Is there a point of no return? So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels when we're supposed to walk in the counsel of God. In Jeremiah 7, 24, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their, what, hearts? No, evil hearts. And went backward and not forward. They wanted to do it their way. Ah, I'm not going to believe in this God you Christians believe in. I don't believe in that. What can he do? I'll tell you what he can do. He saved me. He saved you. The evidence is there. You're going to heaven. How many of you know you're going to heaven? Say amen. amen. God did that. And I will share with the atheist, God can do it for you if you're willing to open your heart. But are they willing? You want to believe? My next step when I talk to atheists, you want to believe? Are you willing to listen? Here's how. Here's how. Look at the, through faith. Through faith, Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made with things that are visible. God made this universe, whether people want to believe it or not, but it's got to be by faith. Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is first, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him second. Did you get that first? Must believe that there is a God, but what did I say? Believing in a God, it doesn't stop there. Next, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you seek him, you desire, God will reveal himself to you. As he did for me at the age of 24. Oh, I believed in a God all my life. Didn't take any wisdom there. I just knew it. All my life I knew there was a God. But was I saved? No. Because I never accepted him as my Lord and Savior. That's what makes him real. Many people believe in God. And then they're atheists two years later. How many of you read the article, The Seven Day Adventist Preacher? He decided he was seven days, but he went to Bible college, I'm sure, seminary. And then he went out and decided to do some, well, break the law of God, come out and be you separate. He didn't study that verse. And he decided to go live with atheists for a while, and he became a devout atheist. Now he's a devout atheist. So he believed 
in a God. Now he doesn't. He's in a, why? Because he never experienced God. He never had it in the heart. A preacher. So if it can happen to a preacher, it can happen to anybody. Amen? Amen. Obviously, the Holy Spirit did not indwell that individual. For the Bible said in John 14, 16, it says what? It said 15 and 16, it says come out. The Holy Spirit will indwell with you forever. Amen? So through faith, Next, and this is where it counts, brothers and sisters. How do I know there's a God? How do I can say to you, how can I stand up here and preach a God to you I can't see? Or you can't see? What gives me that ability? Not my own, that's for sure. What gives me the ability to say to you, there is a God and he will save you? Here's it, through a new creation. Uh, through a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Has that happened to you? If it hasn't, you're not saved. If it hasn't, you believe in God, in a God, but you've never accepted Jesus. See, when he created me, he created a new heart. When he saved me, he put the new heart within me. So now I no longer say I believe in a God or the God. I have accepted Jesus Christ. If you say you believe in God, you must be willing to accept him. And to do that means we have to accept Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Even in the book of Ezekiel 36, 26, Old Testament says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Wow. Isn't that great? See, when he saved me, when he saved you, he gave you a new heart. He didn't try to change the other one. It was beyond repair. It was corrupted by sin. When he saved you, he gave you a new heart, a new desire, a new renewing. Ephesians 4, 23, the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, the renewing of your mind and renewing of your spirit. He, God has proven himself to me over and over. How can I just walk up and say, oh, Jesus is in my heart? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to believe it. It's another thing to accept it. And it's another thing to live by it. I'd live by it. I'd try to preach it and teach it. Why? Because he has proven himself over and over and over again to me. How about you? That is how we prove there is an invisible God. 1 Peter 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides, did you get that? Forever. Amen. God saved you for a purpose. You're going to come against atheists. They're difficult to preach to. You're going to come across agnostics. That's ones that just haven't made up their mind one way or another. And then you're going to come across the toughest ones of all. You know who that is? The religious crowd. Those religious people, those ones that go to church every Sunday and they, they pretend to be a Christian and they go to church and they're very religious, very pious. Kind of reminds you of the scribes and Pharisees, doesn't it? And the Sadducees. They were the most religious group. Jesus attacked the religious group more than any other. They thought their righteousness would get them to heaven. Yet Romans 10.3 makes it clear they depended on their own righteousness and not the righteousness of God. My righteousness, your righteousness will not get you salvation. God's righteousness will. Amen? Amen. I guarantee you come up against a real religious person without Christ, they're very difficult. You go up to a religious person who thinks they're right, and you go tell them, did you know you're lost and you're a sinner? Boy, you just forget it. You're not going to convince them, are you? How many of you have confronted a religious person? Beware of them. I'd, I'll tackle an atheist agnostic anytime. 
But that religious crowd, they have their halos on so tight their horns are sticking through. I mean, you can't convince them they're lost. No, I'm, I do this, I do that. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Perfect example. Write those verses down. Lord, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? Haven't we cast out demons? Haven't we done this? Haven't we named a name? And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. The religious crowd. The pious crowd. You can recognize them. They're in churches they're always doing this. Why isn't Jim smiling in church? He never smiles. Watch Bob. Why is it, wasn't he here last week? He was here last Sunday night and I got to pick on him. Well, Alice, I don't know. She missed Sunday school two years ago. It's looking bad. That's the religious crowd. Amen? Always judging. Always casting. Always pointing the finger. You know, ah, so Janet has to work two jobs and raise kids. That's no excuse. And Janet, I know, wants to say, try it sometime. <laughs> Amen? You always got those religious groups out there. Why weren't you in church this Sunday? Why, why? Christians don't ever do that. It's none of your business. It's none of my business. We're not to say, why weren't you in church? Find out, pray for them. I, like Jesus, I am so repulsed by the religious crowd. And they always judge, listen, they always judge before all the facts are in. Don't mind me picking on you, Janet. Janet has to hold down two jobs. Has to Sometimes she just can't make it to church. But no, that religious group. No, Brad couldn't make it last week. I don't care if his whole family from all over the world came to visit him. <laughs> They're only going to spot the fact that Brad wasn't in church last week. I don't know about you, but I'm repulsed by those people. I mean, it's none of our business. Romans 14, never judge. Jesus said over and over and over, who are you to judge? Amen. And we're all guilty of it at times. Admit it. And boy, look out. You want to turn Christians away from Christ? That's the quickest way of doing it. Amen? One day people, you come to me and say, you got a cute little nose on your face. And I, and I always tell them it looks cuter when I keep it on my face. And I don't stick it in other people's business. Amen? Be careful how we do that. So how do we talk? How do we convince an atheist without judging him? How do we talk to the religious guy? It's one thing to just believe in a God. You have to accept him. The conclusion is this. The true atheist is either foolish or wicked. Foolish because he ignores the evidence that God exists or wicked because he refuses to live by God's truth. When witnessing to an atheist, remember this. You're out to win a soul for Christ, not win an argument. But encourage them to take the next step. Just believing is not a enough. Amen? Same with the religious crowd. Don't put down their religions. Don't put down their denomination. Don't put down them. Lift them up. Amen? Boy, there's a verse I learned many years ago. You may want to write this one down. Galatians 6.1. Be careful that we don't judge others lest we fall under the same temptation. I've learned that from God. What goes around comes back to bite me. Amen? Amen. I have a saying on my wallet at work that says, God doesn't propose to judge a man until he's dead, so why should I? Hey, amen. I like that. Amen. We're not here to judge. We're here to love. We're not here to judge. We're here to share. We're not here to judge. We're here to preach. We're not here to judge. We're here to proclaim. We're not here to judge. We're here to live it. And how did Jesus live it? He came to die for the lost. Amen? In conclusion. Conclusion? In closure. Well, I heard a chuckle, so I, 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 knew, I knew that didn't escape you. Judging Christians. I got you. All right, I got you. Dave, your number's up, baby.
Okay. Let me try this again. Last verse. Now let me say it gently. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You know what drove me, Midge and I, away those 15 years? But when we backslid, it wasn't atheists. It was a religious group. It was a church that stung us. The very people we thought would be behind us, and they were behind us with a 52 Ginzu set. Isn't that ironic? And I blame them. I blame you. I blame everybody. I blame the church. Till God said, you're not here to worship them. You're here to worship me. Amen. Christians, I'm convinced, Christians drive more Christians away from church than the unbelievers do. Amen? Remember, there is a God. We know Him. But one day you may be asked to share Him with an atheist. Be careful how you do it. Do it as Jesus did it, and you'll win a soul. Do it the religious way, and you'll lose one. Amen, as we sing. At the end of each service, I encourage anybody who is not absolutely sure that they're going to heaven. How would you like to make sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that if you were to pass from this world into the next, would you be with Jesus in heaven? I encourage those who would like to bow their heads right now and ask Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. That's all God asks you to do, to trust Him by faith and accept Him by His marvelous grace and ask Him into your heart and you can be saved today. In Jesus' name, amen.